We are raising an entire generation of children under the bombardment of cartoons and television shows that are telling them that the occult and Eastern philosophy is a wonderful thing, not something to be afraid of, not something ugly and fearful. You know, you might not speak the same language, but actually, Star Wars is universal. It deifies both nature and femaleness, and believes Mother Goddess to be the original deity. She is worshipped in many forms. Thank you for your love and your light. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. For the weapons of our warfare is not carnal, but mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. The Force has a dark and a light side. That's black magic and white magic. The doorway into the occult is an altered state of consciousness. Let the Force take over. That's an altered state of consciousness. Yoda is a yogi. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. You'd rather reprove them. Ahsoka means love and light. Welcome to Conspiracy in the Force, Season 3, Star Wars and the New Age Deception. With me, Conspiracy Kyle. Kyle. All things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. Welcome back to another episode of Conspiracy in the Force. I'm your host, Conspiracy Kyle. This is episode two of season three of the podcast, titled Ahsoka and the Law of Attraction. On this episode, we will tackle a few things. We will first discuss the character of Ahsoka Tano, the star of the new series out now. We will talk her background in Star Wars lore, and also some real-life symbolism. We will then finish off in talking about the actresses who have portrayed her and some very New Agey type quotes they've made about the character, and also how New Age thoughts and ideas are discussed and critiqued in the Bible. I won't have time here today to discuss the first two episodes of the Ahsoka series, but I'll be back soon with a new episode focusing on those in more detail. But for now, let's get into it. Now, I'm not going to assume everyone who's listening to this knows who the character of Ahsoka is intimately, So here's a brief summary. We're first introduced to Ahsoka Tano in the Clone Wars animated series, which took place during the three year period from where Episode 2 Attack of the Clones ended to where Episode 3 Revenge of the Sith ended. Ahsoka was the Padawan to Anakin Skywalker, the future Darth Vader. Now before the Clone War ended, she decided to leave the Jedi Order after being falsely accused of crimes. Though exonerated, She had lost faith in the rigidly orthodox beliefs of the Jedi, in the ruling body, the Jedi Council. She reappeared several years later in the Star Wars Rebels animated series in the years leading up to Episode 4 A New Hope, as a character with the codename Fulcrum. She essentially was an agent of the Grown Rebellion, in working with Rebel cells to aid in the downfall of the Empire. In that series, she came face to face with her former master, now Darth Vader, and fought against him. She was presumed dead in this duel, but somehow survived after being pulled away from Vader by rebel Ezra Bridger into a weird portal area called the World Between Worlds. At the end of the Rebel series, she is seen taking on the character of Sabine, a Mandalorian, as her own Padawan. Now many years go by again, and we see her searching for longtime enemy Grand Admiral Thrawn, who is said to have re-emerged after being presumed dead many years prior. This is during the Mandalorian series era, which is several years after Return of the Jedi, Episode 6. 
she is the one who finds out Baby Yoda is actually a Padawan from the Jedi Temple named Grogu, and she is an onlooker to Grogu's training with Luke Skywalker. And mind you, for purposes of this podcast, we will continue to call him Baby Yoda. Thank you. So that's the basic chronology. She's basically been all over the saga, in every single era. Now the Ahsoka series will focus on her quest to find Thrawn, who has designs on bringing back the Empire of Old. And it will also focus on their search for Ezra, who is presumed dead as well. Now, what I want to discuss today is not my thoughts about what the series may hold, or even about the first few episodes that have already aired, but about what the character of Ahsoka herself means. What do fans think about her? What do those who have portrayed her think about her? And ultimately, what is the purpose of her character? Well, first, let's discuss her name itself. In a book I recently obtained called The Dictionary of Cults, Sects, Religions, and the Occult, I was shocked to find an entry for the name Ahsoka, albeit spelled without the H. Here's what it says. Ahsoka was a king of India from 272 to 232 BC. He is considered to be one of the greatest of all kings, not only because he conquered most of the Indian peninsula, but also because after converting to Buddhism, he transformed it into a conglomerate of little sects into one of the chief religions of India. Only after Ahsoka sent missionaries throughout the empire did the movement flourish and become united. United. Now, interestingly enough, Ahsoka's last name, Tano, has a religious subtext as well. Now, this entry is spelled T-A-N-H-A, which is slightly different from Ahsoka Tano in Star Wars, which is spelled T-A-N-O, but nonetheless. In this dictionary, the name Tana refers to lust, or the entire spectrum of desire against Buddhism. So as you can see, which I've been realizing has been evident in Star Wars mythology, is that there's a strong tie to Buddhism, a religion which denies the one true God of the Bible and is more concerned with following your own path, your own light, your own enlightenment. Also, it's quite interesting that her first name, Ahsoka, is a positive light reference to Buddhism, a reference to a pro-Buddhist teacher, while her last name is a negative dark reference to Buddhism with a reference to anti-Buddhist desires. So here you have the Masonic reconciliation of opposites going on, the black and white checkerboard. And this is symbolic of the character herself. She leaves the Jedi Order and forges her own path, where she can use both light and dark as she needs without fear. A gray force user, if you will. This leads us into some quotes to discuss. As you'll see, fans see Ahsoka as almost a sort of god, a figure to look up to and lead them on their life journey. Here are some quotes from fans at a recent Ahsoka celebration event. Probably one of the biggest mentors in Star Wars. She has found her own way. She listens to her own voice. Oh, I love Ahsoka because it's a really good, empowering female character in the Star Wars universe. Staying true to yourself, believing in what you believe in, sticking up for the little guys. It's really important to listen to, you know, what the voice inside and do what you know is right. Ahsoka means kindness and bravery and tenacity. Ahsoka means love and light. So as you can see, there's some intense hero worship going on here with Ahsoka. Follow your own path. Listen to the voice inside. Love and light. These are all New Age philosophies that people have gleaned from the character of Ahsoka. Now, going back to following your heart, as stated in the Bible in Jeremiah 17, 9, we know that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. So trusting our own path ultimately leads to destruction. Now, even when you listen to actresses Ashley Eckstein and Rosario Dawson, who have played Ahsoka in animation and live action respectively, you will notice that they also use some very new age phraseology in their interviews describing their journey with this character. Here's Ashley Eckstein talking about when she met Rosario Dawson in person. But you have also had the chance to 
visit the set of the Ahsoka series. I did, I did. So I'm a big believer in making your dreams come true. And so last year on this stage, I threw out a dream and I said, I hadn't met Rosario yet. And um, I, I dreamed that I would hope to meet her soon. And we actually got to meet on the set of Ahsoka. It was amazing. So there's your manifesting or making things come to life with the power of your positive thoughts as if you are God. You may have also heard this as referred to as the law of attraction with law being in air quotes as it's not a law or scientific whatsoever. And now here's Ashley again talking further about the character of Ahsoka and how this character has impacted her personally. And towards the end of this clip, you'll hear something very disturbing and pretty much blasphemous. Ahsoka Tano has transcended beyond this character that we love. Uh, this is why I started the hashtag Ahsoka lives in all of us. Ahsoka is literally changing lives and saving lives. Yikes. A fictional character is saving lives and dwells within us, like the Holy Spirit lives in, within believers in Christ. You know, this is more than just an appreciation of a character. It's very cult-like and dangerous. People may think I'm overreacting or making a big deal out of this, but I seriously think that there are those out there, mostly girls, who do view Ahsoka as an idol or a god in their lives. I swear people will trust in literally anything before they open up the Bible and take a look. It would be comical if it wasn't so sad, potentially leading a generation of fans towards hell. Now here's Rosario Dawson in an interview from the Star Wars Celebration Convention earlier this year. Now here's some context before we play this clip. Several years ago, she was rumored to be a good candidate for Ahsoka if Ahsoka was ever to be in a live action show. How do we get you in a Star Wars movie? I know it's not comic book, but... Yo, the fans have been pushing for Ashoka Tano for a minute now. That's, yes. Which would that be was so whole campaign. dope. Yeah. I know, like someone did the art and then I reposted it and then Star Wars started following me and then everybody started thinking it was a whole thing and it's just literally been this internet situation. Mm -hmm. So internet, if it happens, it's because of you. So, then with that being said, take a listen to this. You spent quite a few years with the character already. Yeah. First playing her in live action in The Mandalorian season two. I imagine you've gotten to know her quite well. Yes, very, very well. And uh, she's left quite the impression on me. It's definitely been, I think, a lifestyle change. I meditate every day. I feel like I, I manifested this role, so I'm just throwing it out there to keep manifesting. Keep manifesting. Keep manifesting. Oh, season two. <laughs> you did. I think you brought up Ahsoka years and years ago. I did, in yeah. In an interview, and now here we are. We are. We are. Again, there's more Law of Attraction nonsense. My thoughts and my good vibes cause this thing to happen. Keep manifesting, they say. You create your own reality. More New Age garbage meant to make us the rulers of our own destiny. We don't need to submit to God because we are God. You know, this thought process goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3. Here's verses 1 through 5 about the snake tempting Eve with the forbidden fruit. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree in the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat it neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, that your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And since that time, humanity has again and again tried to take more and more forbidden fruit for themselves, trying to be God. Just a few chapters later in Genesis 11, we hear the story of the Tower of Babel. And what was the purpose there? Well, here's verse 4. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. In one final example, when Moses had gone up to receive the Ten Commandments from God, the Israelite people, in their impatience for Moses to return, they tried to find a better way for themselves. They tried to take ownership of the properties of God and put that on themselves. Here's Exodus 32, verse 1. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, 
the people gathered together unto Aaron, and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as this man Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And there are many other passages discussing how the ancient Israelites in the Old Testament and the people in Jesus' time during the New Testament chose to follow their own way, to be their own gods. As I go through this season, I'll be bringing up more and more of these examples. At the end of the day, submission to God isn't enslaving yourself to some evil god like the Gnostics believe. But as Jesus states in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Every other way to quote-unquote spiritual perfection will lead to spiritual ruin. Generic spirituality or God is in me spirituality that's focused on yourself and not the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit will lead you toward a rude awakening in the afterlife. I urge you all those listening to follow Christ. Well, that will do it for this episode of Conspiracy in the Force. I know the first two episodes of the Ahsoka series have dropped, but I'm still going through these hoping to mine some good discussion points. Because honestly, on first watch, I didn't really see much deep content, only surface level stuff. But I'll give it another go and be back to break it all down soon. This is Conspiracy Kyle, signing off. God bless. God bless.